Today, I'm going to talk about the bacterium Escherichia coli and synthetic biology. And I'm going to focus on transcription and its regulation. What I want to try and convince you in the next 20 minutes or so is that by understanding the mechanism of transcription and its regulation, we can, we can lead on to the development of switches and tools that can be useful in the exploitation of Escherichia coli in synthetic biology. I think it's important to understand that, that, that manipulating transcription is, is a means to an end, but not an end in itself. So let me start off by telling you a little bit about Escherichia coli. A typical Escherichia coli um, cell has a single chromosome. It contains something like 4,500 genes, and these genes will be organized into 3,000 transcription units. The amazing thing is that there's a single species of RNA polymerase that copies those transcription units into RNA. Now, if you bust open a typical Escherichia coli cell, you'll find 4,000 or so molecules of RNA polymerase. Now, at first sight, that looks as if there's plenty of RNA polymerase to go around all the transcription units, but actually that's that's an illusion because it turns out that some of the transcript, small number of the transcription un, um, units receive a, a lot of RNA polymerase. So what this means is that there are a lot of transcription units that are, at, that, that are short of RNA polymerase. In other words, in the cell, RNA polymerase is in short supply. So Escherichia coli is very, very good at distributing its RNA polymerase between different genes according to the needs, the need being which gene needs to be expressed at a particular instant. And the bottom line is the result is that certain genes get a lot of RNA polymerase, certain don't get very much. And what I want to convince you is that by understanding the, these rules that, that govern the distribution of RNA polymerase, we can then subvert them um, and create switches um, that, of course, can be used um, to enable synthetic biology in Escherichia coli. So Escherichia coli is a very, very good tool, or chassis, if you wish, for, for, for doing this. Now, one other thing about Escherichia coli that makes it a good chassis is that actually there's no such thing as Escherichia coli. There's no such one thing as Escherichia coli. Actually, there are millions, if not millions of millions, of different sorts of Escherichia coli swimming around in, in the world. Because, you see, the Escherichia coli that we use in the lab is just one of millions and millions of species. And if you look at the sequence of these species, what you see is an enormous divergence in sequence. Actually, the number of common genes between the different species is actually quite small. So what this is telling us is that over billions of years, Escherichia coli has diverged and has picked up genes, it's lost genes, um, and actually it's very, very good at picking up genes, losing genes, and adapting. So of course, from a synthetic biology point of view, this makes it um, the perfect chassis, because, because what we want to work with is something which is capable of receiving genes and losing genes, and is going to be adaptable. Okay, so now we need to just focus on, um, on the topic, which is the transcription of DNA, um, in, in, in DNA into RNA. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, some models of this wonderful enzyme that does this job. This enzyme is called RNA polymerase. Um, it's a little molecular machine consists of different subunits. The two major subunits are called beta and beta primed. So they're colored in this, in this ball diagram as blue and this rather gaudy pink color. Basically, these two subunits form what's called a, a crab claw, i.e. there's a gap between them. And basically what happens is the DNA that's being transcribed is, is threaded through. There's a rather more complicated picture um, of, 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 of that here. And basically what this, this, this wonderful motor does is it motors along the DNA DNA, copying DNA sequences into RNA. 
This form of the enzyme, by the way, is known as the core enzyme. It consists of the two big subunits that form the active site of the enzyme that actually does the job, and um, the two big subunits, beta and beta prime, are held together by two alpha subunits. So these are, these are shown here in, 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 in yellow and orange. And this is a highly conserved structure that, um, that is found, actually, um, in, 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 in most li living cells. Now, the problem with this, this structure is that whilst it's good at making RNA, it is incapable of knowing where to start and starting transcription. Turns out in bacteria, starting transcription is really important because by starting transcription at specific positions, first of all, it, allow, it, it, it ensures that full-length messages are always made, but also it allows for, for regulation. So the question is, how did bacteria solve the problem of directing this RNA polymerase to specific starts? And basically, bacteria solve this problem by using a very, very simple tool, and this tool is called the sigma subunit. So there is a, a sub, an extra subunit called sigma that, that evolved, whose job is really to guide RNA polymerase to start at specific Positions. Now, interestingly, bacteria use sigma subunits. Other, other organisms, um, eukaryotes, for example, use a completely different method um, for solving the same problem. And, of course, what this is telling us is that bacteria, of course, during their evolution branched off um, from the eukaryotes a long time ago and, and basically have used sigma subunits to drive um, regulation. So let's take a look at a sigma subunit. Here's a very, very um, elementary diagram of a typical sigma subunit. Um, most, not all sigma subunits, carry four independently folding domains. And like in all proteins, that contain independently folding domains. The independently folding domains each do an individual job. In the case of sigma subunits, the domains recognize different bits of DNA sequence at promoters. I remind you that promoters are the sequences at the beginning of genes that specify where transcripts start. And to cut a, 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 a long story short, the, the, the four Independently folding domains are referred to as domain one, two, three, and four. Uh, domain two contacts something called the minus 10 element at target promoters. Domain four contacts something called the minus 35 element at target promoters. Now, let me show you a, a sketch which hopefully will make this really clear for you. This is a sketch derived from some brilliant structural biology done by the Seth Darst lab about 15 years ago. Basically, the Darst lab solved the high-resolution structure of an RNA, a bacterial RNA polymerase molecule carrying a sigma subunit. And what you can see, if you look really hard, is you can see the crab claw, the beta and beta prime subunits are colored light blue and, and, and pink. And basically, some of the domains of the sigma subunit show up in their structure, and they're shown up in this gold structure. So we have domain two, domain three, and domain four. Actually, in this structure, domain one doesn't show up. And basically, this, 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 this very, very simple diagram that comes from a most amazing piece of work shows how sigma subunits work. Basically, the different domains of sigma are splayed across the surface of the core enzyme, and they provide a template for the recognition of DNA. And if you look very closely at this slide, you can see how the three um, domains of sigma shown here, two, three, and four, recognize three individual segments or or elements of the promoter. Now, there's a simpler way of looking at this, and this is to, to just, just show a, 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 a diagram. So here's, here's a, a schematic diagram of what you just saw, grossly simplified, but basically showing the sigma subunit in, in orange here. And the idea is that the three domains of the sigma, two, three, and four, contact three different elements at the promoter. Now, there's one other point that, um, that I need to make here, and this turns out to be really important in, in a moment, and this point concerns the alpha subunits. Remember I told you that RNA polymerase contains two alpha subunits, and I told you that the alpha subunits are responsible for the assembly of the beta and beta prime subunits. Turns out that each alpha subunit actually contains two domains, an N-terminal domain 
a large N-terminal domain and a small C-terminal domain. Turns out that it's the large N-terminal domain that does the holding together of the beta beta primed, and the, the small C-terminal domain shown here as these two cherry-like things attached to the N-terminal domain via a, a, a line which represents a flexible linker. It turns out that these two C-terminal domains fold up into a structure that recognizes yet another element at promoters, and this element is called the, called the up element. So altogether, when RNA polymerase recognizes a transcription start site, there are four main interactions. Three made with different elements by the sigma factor, and one made by the two alpha CTDs. And basically together, these elements drive RNA polymerase to promoters and position RNA polymerase so that it can begin transcription at specific positions. One thing you need to know, just before I move on, is that, that different combinations of these four elements are found at different promoters. So not all promoters have all four elements. And actually, the efficiency of, of, of any particular promoter is determined by the combination of the elements. And um, rather like you could make up a pound, um, or a dollar, I guess I should say, with various small coins, you can make up a promoter with various combinations of these, of these four elements. Now, a moment ago, I told you that different transcription units receive different amounts of RNA polymerase in Escherichia coli. The question is why? So if we look at the textbook, we'll see that there are three reasons, and they're listed here. First one is what I just told you. The different promoter sequence elements, the minus 10, um, the minus 35, something called the extended minus 10, which is the region between the minus 10, minus 35, and the up elements differ from one promoter to another. So according to the, 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 the precise sequence, a promoter is going to be able to capture polymerase more or less efficiently. Second factor is, is the sigma factor. Um, turns out that many bacteria um, don't just contain one sigma factor, they contain multiple sigma factors. Turns out that most E. coli strains contain seven sigma factors, a major sigma factor, which is called sigma 70, and six other sigma factors. These six other sigma factors come into play in response to certain stresses. And basically what they do is these sigma factors capture enzymes and drive it to promoters specified via domains two, three, and four of these alternative sigma factors. I'm not gonna say anything more about sigma factors now, but you should be able to see how by changing sigma factor, you can actually change promoter specificity. This is a strategy used by many bacteria um, to, 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 to alter gene expression in response to external cues. And of course, this is something that synthetic biologists are going to be able to exploit in the future. And of course, they're particularly, it's going to be very well, well placed to exploit it because we know that sigma factors um, are made up of independently folded domains. So it's not rocket science to see how you could alter particular domains to alter um, alter promoter specificity. But I'm not going to say anything more about sigma factors because I want to, to move on rapidly to the third um, um, mechanism that drives the distribution of RNA polymerase between different promoters, which is transcription factors. And E. coli contains somewhere between 250 and 300 of these factors, or I should more accurately say most E. coli strains contain this sort of number of transcription factors. And, and these come in two flavors activators and repressors. So I guess most of you will know that repressors function by binding at active promoters. So these are promoters that have good minus 10, minus 35 up elements. Um, repressors function by binding to those promoters and shutting down their expression. Activators do the inverse. So activators interact at promoters that are defective in some way, such the promoter's not receiving enough RNA polymerase. The job of the activator is to, to reverse that and make sure that the promoter um, receives more RNA polymerase, thereby driving transcription. Interestingly, most of these transcription factors um, contain, also contain domains. And most of them, can, not all of them, but most of them contain what I call a 
business domain. So that's the domain that actually binds to the promoter and does the business of activation or repression. And then most transcription factors contain another domain, which is often referred to as a regulatory domain. And that ensures that the transcription factor responds to a particular environmental cue. Now, again, it's not rocket science to see that by mixing and matching regulatory domains with business domains, the synthetic biologist can create a whole bunch of, of, different, um, of different transcription factors that can do um, desired jobs. Now, what I want to focus on now for the, for the rest of the talk is activators. Because I, what, what I want to argue, well, what I want to explain to you first is how activators work. And then on the basis of that, I want to explain to you how we can create new promoters that are regulated by different combinations of activators. Now, just for completeness, I should say that you could do the same with repressors, but, but but for this talk, I'm just going to focus on activators. So number one question is, how do activators work? Well, the start point is what I just told you, and that is activators function to recruit RNA polymerase to promoters where the different promoter elements are insufficient to recruit enough RNA polymerase. And a whole lot of studies done by many labs across the world have actually shown the mechanism of action of activators is quite simple. So most activators are dimers. They bind just upstream of the target promoters. And they contain a little patch shown here as a yellow, um, yellow spot. And this little patch is called an activating region. And what's going to happen is this little patch is going to interact with a part of RNA polymerase directly recruiting the RNA polymerase to that promoter. Why does it need to do that? Well, because the various promoter elements are insufficient to do that. Now, of course, it's easy to, to, to use PowerPoint to draw this. So it, here we are, here comes the RNA polymerase. And this, this tells us that many activators function by making an interaction with the C-terminal domain of the RNA polymerase alpha subunit. Now, there's an interesting point that I, I, that I must just mark here. Of course, polymerase contains two um, alpha subunits, and uh, most activators contain two identical subunits, each of which would have an activating region. But it turns out that actually, in order to recruit RNA polymerase, you only need one interaction. And this has been proved um, experimentally. Now, another thing um, about this sort of activation, which we, which we call activation by recruitment or activation by Velcro, because at the end of the day, the activating region is just like a little Velcro patch that hooks the RNA polymerase to, to the promoter, is that this activation is crucially dependent on the location of the activator upstream of the promoter. So you take a single promoter and you move the activator around, you'll find some locations where it works and some locations where it doesn't work. And interestingly, what you find is that the locations where it works are normally separated by 10 or 11 base pairs. In other words, one turn of the helix. This is some data, very old data from my lab in which we took a promoter that was being activated by a single activator. And basically what we did was we moved the, the, gray, the gray boxes, the activator, to different locations. So these locations are shown on the x-axis. The y-axis um, shows the activity of the promoter. And what you see very, very clearly is that there are some locations where it works, some where it doesn't. And the distance between the locations where it works correspond to the turn of the helix. So the idea is that in order for activation to take place, the activator and the polymerase have to be lined up on the same on the same face of the helix. Now, of course, you could, you could ask a very, very interesting question here. You could say, well, hang on a second. If you move the activator by one base pair, you're, you're, you're twisting the activator round, round the helix. Why, why can't the DNA just twist back? Or, or if, if that linker that joins the C-terminal domain of alpha with the N-terminal domain, if that's so flexible, why can't that join? But of course, the thing is, that requires an energetic penalty. You have to pay energy to do that. And um, the fact that these spikes um, are, are, are so sharp um, is telling you that that energetic penalty is, is too much to pay. And this brings me to a, a really interesting experiment 
proposed just a couple of years ago by a um, professor of biochemistry at um, Peking University, um, Yi Ping Wang. And he, he suggested that if, 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 you could, if you could increase the binding of the activator to the RNA polymerase, then maybe, may, maybe, um, maybe these peaks would broaden. Maybe, you, may, maybe some of these locations um, where there was no activation um, could, could become locations where there is activation. Okay, so, so, so his idea was very, very simple. And um, t together we did some of these experiments. So basically the idea is, um, rather than presenting you with all his data, I've just presented you with some cartoons. So we start at the top. This is the sort of promoter that I spoke about. And I want you to imagine that the the, the activator is misplaced, say, by one base pair, such that it doesn't work. What Yi Ping's student did was introduce an up element. So this is shown as the, um, as the blue rectangle here, just downstream of the activator in the middle. That, of course, increases the binding of alpha-CTD to the DNA. And actually, this, this, this little menage a trois of the DNA, the alpha-CTD, and the activator the, the three components bind cooperatively together. And it turns out that when you measure the activity of this promoter, this promoter actually activity actually goes up. So the conclusion of this is that, it, that if, if, if you beef up the binding, um, you actually allow the activator to, 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 to function at a location where it wouldn't normally function. Now, in a moment, I hope you'll see why this is important. F following that, um, we, we, we had a, a great idea that complemented the Chinese experiment, and that was, well, hey, rather than putting in an up element, why not put in another activator? And so this is shown in the bottom um, of the, the, the bottom sketch here, and the little red square or little red rectangle, that's another activator. And it turns out that you can produce exactly the same effect just by putting in another activator. So essentially, just by working with these simple principles, we've created a promoter that is dependent on two activators. Now, why, why is this important for synthetic biologists? Well, it's important for the following reasons. Of course, it, it would be easy for a synthetic biologist to take the information I've just told you and design a promoter that was triggered just by a single activator, a, a new activator. That would be easy. But it would be much smarter for the promoter to be codependent upon two signals rather than one, or even three signals. Because if you could do that, you could produce combinatorial reg regulation. And so, so this little experiment here actually suggests a great idea, which is that one could exploit the fact that RNA polymerase has two alpha subunits and that, that activators can function independently, binding RNA polymerase to, 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 to increase the recruitment of RNA polymerase to promoters, to create switches um, in, 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 in in which expression was absolutely dependent upon two activators. So the question is, of course, has, has, has E. coli thought of this already, metaphorically, of course? And the answer, of course, is yes. This is our, our, our typical activator doing its stuff by interacting with alpha-CTD. It turns out that there are many, many examples um, of naturally occurring promoters where a second activator works by interacting with the second subunit of RNA polymerase. Now, what I didn't tell you earlier was there are dozens, if not scores, or even hundreds of activators that work like this. So in this example, um, I've, I've just shown it schematically with the yellow and the red. But, but you, actually, I think you can see that this mechanism could, could work with pretty much any activator which, which played this game. And of course, what this does is this opens the possibility um, to to, 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 to new combinations. Um, th these are just some data to show that, um, that, uh, that, that, that it really does work in the lab. So in this experiment here, what, what we've done is we've taken a promoter with a single activator anchored at one position. We've then moved the position of the second activator on the DNA. So again, it's the same deal. The x-axis um, denotes the position of the activator that we're moving. The y-axis denotes the activity. And what you can see is there are locations where the second activator works and locations where it doesn't work. And again, the, 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 the phenomenon is 
face of the helix dependent. In other words, the things have to be lined up on the same face of, of, of the DNA. Okay, right, so to, to, and, and this, this, this slide shows a few examples taken from the literature, and actually on here there's also one example where Anne Hofschild's lab um, at Harvard Medical School actually took two activators that normally don't talk to each other and showed that they could function synergically to, 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 together. So just to summarize, the idea is that, that most activators in E. coli function via mechanism like this or similar mechanism and because they function by making contacts with different patches on the RNA polymerase um, um, we, we can mix and match different activators to to produce um, new new combinations but of course in order for this to work for the promoter to be codependent on both activators present at the same time what you have to do is you have to stop the promoter being activated just by a single activator. And in order to do that, you play this little trick of misplacing one of the activators. So we call this the independent contact model for transcription activation. Um, just, to, just to show you that I'm not ma making this up, here are some, some data um, produced by a member of my lab, Doug, Doug Browning. So what Doug has done here is he's compared the the activity of a test promoter with either one activator or two activators. Now, in both cases, you see when you go from one activator to two activator, the, the activity increases. That's the, 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 the y-axis. And what you see is at the starting promoter, this is on the left here, um, um, the, the, the activation is probably something like twofold, and that's because the first activator is, is pretty good at activating. But if you misplace the first activator, so now you move to this, this slide on the right, so if you now misplace the first activator, the ability of the activator to activate falls right down, and now you get incredible synergy. I think it's a 15-fold 15 15 synergy, and you can play this game uh, forever to tune the, the pro your promoter to get the output that that you want. So we call this um, activation by independent contacts and I just stress that one of the reasons it works is because um, the RNA polymerase has two, two, two alpha subunits and each alpha subunit has a C-terminal domain and I would just point out that these C-terminal domains are highly conserved throughout most um, most most bacteria. Interestingly, they're not found in in, in, in eukaryotes. In eukaryotes, the subunits that encode that carry, that, that fulfil the alpha function, one subunit does have a C terminal domain. The other, the other, the other, the other doesn't. Okay, so this is activation by independent contacts. Just like to finish off by asking a question, which is: Is is there another way of doing it? And yeah, there is. There is another way of doing it. Let me show you what, what that way is. So we're, we're, we're thinking about a promoter that's codependent on two activators. Let's call them A and B. Okay. So here are A and B. Now A and B, in this case, don't bind to the DNA. Remember in the previous case, A and B bound independently to the DNA. But in this case, A and B have to interact together before they bind to the DNA. And when they bind, that recruits uh, RNA polymerase. So basically, this creates the same thing. This creates codependence. You have codependence on A and B, but this time the codependence is due to the fact that A has to bind to B and B has to bind to A before the complex binds to the DNA and interacts with the RNA polymerase. Now, it turns out that in bacteria, or perhaps I should rephrase this, in the bacteria that have been studied so far, because I remind you that, that so far probably only, I think, 0.1% of bacteria have been studied. So these grand rules which I'm enunciating that come from E. coli, uh, whilst they apply to E. coli, might not apply to some other bacteria. In fact, they probably don't. It's just we don't know about it. But in the cases that we've looked at so far, you very, very rarely find this. You find independent binding of A and B, and A and B making independent contacts. You find a lot of that, but you don't find much of this. In fact, I, I, I believe last time I looked, I found just three examples amongst thousands of examples. Of course, the question is, why is that? And I believe that there is a simple explanation, and it comes from the dynamic genomes 
of bacteria. The fact that bacterial genomes are dynamic, are changing all the time. Remember I told you at the beginning that there were millions and millions of species of E. coli, million millions of types of E. coli that have wildly different, different genes. Now the point is that if, if you're going to fix co-regulation by A cooperatively binding to B, A has to have a surface that binds to B and B has to find, have a surface that binds to A. So the two have to be committed to each other. Okay? And of course if they're committed to each other, that, that's then fixed. Okay? Now of course, if A then wants to go and play with C, it can't. Or D, or E, or F. So what I'm trying to get over is that I believe that, 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 that the independent binding model that I just showed you, um, which we find very frequently at co-regulated promoters in E. coli. I believe that that has been favored in evolution over the cooperative binding model, simply because it allows far more flexibility. It allows far more mix and, max, mix and match. Now, interestingly, in eukaryotes, um, um, this mechanism of cooperative binding is found very, very commonly um, to, to explain codependent activation of genes. And I think there's a, there's a basic divergence here in, 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 in strategy. Anyway, that's hypothesis that nobody can prove or disprove, but it's an interesting thought, and at least it's an explanation that, um, that, that, that attempts to explain what we see, and also it gives the synthetic biologists uh, plenty of room for, for them to play. And on that topic, I think I want to just finish off by stressing this number, 250, 300. There really are a lot of transcription factors. And um, this is illustrated in this, this um, wonderful diagram that actually is totally out of date and um, very, very, very old, but it makes the point perfectly. This was taken from a review by Julio Calardavides. Calardavides runs the... the, the um, runs a website in which he tries to collate all the information um, on E. coli transcription factors. And what, what you see here is that there's a lot of cross-regulation. Most regulators regulate more than one target. Most reg targets are regulated by more than one regulator. Um, there are a lot of regulators, and um, hence there is a lot of room for synthetic biologists to play. Most of these regulators um, regulate not all, I, I stress, there are some exceptions, but most of these regulators regulate by the mechanisms, the simple mechanisms that I showed you. So, so my ending point is that, that if you take this um, and you take the, the possibility of mixing and matching domains, there really is a lot of evolutionary space into which we can, um, we can move. So I'd like to finish by thanking you for your attention.